Hey, plebe, want to watch Dragon Ball Z? Joe, I'd rather insert a wine bottle into my rectum than ever watch Dragon Ball Z again. Oh, um, Jesus Christ. How about Yu Yu Hakusho? Yu Yu Hakusho? I fucking love Yu Yu Hakusho. A while back, I released a video called Dragon Ball Z Sucks Dragon Balls in which I panned one of the most overrated television shows ever made. Little did I know how much people would love that video and agree with it, and definitely not try to cope with someone pointing out some of the worst storytelling sins in history by writing some of the most ironically funny comments I've ever read. Here's the thing, though. I don't really watch anime. There are only, I think, five animes I've ever seen from beginning to end, and three of them were only 26 episodes long. Four of the five were on Toonami in the late 90s, early 2000s, so a lot of my anime experience has to do with whether or not the shit just happened to be on TV when I got home from school. But I've watched bits and pieces of other animes, and yeah, it's not my thing. I dislike how uniform most animes look, how nearly all of them have the same tropes, both in the animation and the storytelling. Like Sweat Drops. What the fuck is the deal with Sweat Drops? And the animation of a character's face completely changing when their mood changes? I don't know if you know this, but you can show a character's mood changing without changing their entire fucking facial structure. See? I just did it with a smiley face. But there was one anime that aired on Toonami, well, at least the first half of the show did, that, while it was on, I actually grew a real attachment to. That show was Yu Yu Hakusho. Then Toonami stopped airing it, and I never got to finish watching it until very recently. And I can say with absolute certainty that that attachment was completely valid. Because finally watching this show from beginning to end, I felt myself falling in love with it all over again. Yu Yu Hakusho definitely had some classic anime pitfalls. It had some moments of weakness. But Jesus Christ, this show put most of the other shows that were on Toonami back then to shame. So step into my territory, because we're talking about probably my favorite anime of all time. Yu Yu Hakusho? Bingo. And just a reminder, this review is through the lens of a person who does not watch a lot of anime. I don't know if that's going to be refreshing or infuriating. Just keep that in mind. So you may be wondering why this show. There are a lot of reviews on it, and I generally don't like to talk about a show that has a lot of reviews. Unless I'm going against the green by shitting on it. Well, I think a lot of those reviews are actually recommendations. There's the Super Eye Patch Wolf video, the Sensei Hood review, and others that are very good, but they are very spoiler-free and recommendation-heavy. Then, of course, there's Bonsai Pop, who is in the process of an extremely deep dive on the show, but only the first part has been released so far, and I'm more of a generalized reviewer. But in order to really review something, you gotta talk about it in detail, so eventually, there will be a spoiler warning. So because these other recommendations do exist, I'm not gonna dilly-dally too much on the pre-spoiler stuff here. Some of this will be a repeat of what you've seen in other videos, so the least I can do is keep it brief. Yusuke Urameshi is an aimless street punk from a broken home, who has a reputation for violence and whose future is bleak at best. There's Keiko, his only friend and love interest, and Kuwabara, his rival, who becomes a whole lot more to him as the series progresses. But then one day, Yusuke saves a kid from getting hit by a car, and he dies but not quite. He's actually stuck in limbo because Spirit World doesn't know what to do with him. This kicks off a journey where he becomes a spirit detective, investigating and fighting off supernatural dangers to the human race, usually in the form of demons. Yu Yu Hakusho is roughly translated to Ghost Files, at least in context. Out of context, its literal translation has to do with hot oil on white paper. This is why you shouldn't use Google Translate. Ghost Files is actually not a good name for the show because Yusuke does not fight a single ghost, and there are actually very few ghosts in this show at all. Yu Yu is a classic shonen fighting anime. Characters reach new plateaus of power to fight increasingly powerful opponents against insurmountable odds. So if this is the kind of anime you like, you're gonna love this one. And the level of growth these characters experience over the course of the show both physically and emotionally, is pulled off really well. The way it's conveyed is very layered and takes its time, and no character ever becomes the strongest in the universe or whatever the fuck. No one is overpowered out of nowhere. The fights themselves are also very unique to the show. Characters will constantly employ different strategies in every fight they're in, and there are twists and turns all contained within a single fight a lot of the time. 
This makes nearly every fight in the show incredibly engaging. Yu Yu was created by Yoshihiro Tagashi and based on his Shonen Jump manga, which I haven't read, but I do know that the show's final story arc does reflect the amount of stress he was under towards the end of the comic's run, so be warned of that. But trust me, the ride is worth it. The show was directed by Noriyuki Abe, an expert in combining lively animation and interesting sound, if this show is any indicator. Just listen to some of this. <laughs> But the characters are where a lot of the magic of the show lies. There is not a single character I dislike on this show, except for this little fucker, at least at first, but then, well, he grew on me. That's because each of these characters is carefully crafted with a personality that gets them through the trials they each have to face on the show. And I'm not just talking about the fighters. Every character in this show has personality, and almost every character has a lengthy backstory. Even those who don't are at least useful or have a story arc at some point in the show. This is much better than having 50 characters be important for a couple episodes, and then just hang around because you don't know what to fucking do with them. Take Yusuke Yurameshi. Yusuke is an angry kid who has a natural talent for fighting, who learns how to hone it as the series goes on. But Yusuke's upbringing has left him insecure and aimless. This series is sort of the story of him finding good reasons to fight and continue to get stronger. Yusuke is markedly different at the end of each story arc, and the Yusuke we're left with in the end is very different from the one we're shown in the beginning. Yusuke's fighting style is reliant on thinking quickly under stress, taking gambles, and drawing strength from those moments where he's able to connect to his feelings and remember what he's fighting for. Then there's Kuwabara, Yusuke's rival turned friend, possibly my favorite character. Kuwabara is the most loyal, devoted, and principled person on the show, even to a fault. The first to forgive, the first to show mercy, the person most in touch with his own feelings, and yet the biggest knucklehead in the world. Kuwabara is the heart of the show. And heart is his M.O. He might be headstrong, but it's his desire to do the right thing that gives him success in battle. Kurama is part demon, part human, and so has traits of both. He has empathy and loyalty to those he loves, but exhibits absolute ruthlessness to those he despises. He is also a highly intelligent strategist and is without a doubt the smartest person on the show. His ability to analyze every conceivable angle of a situation is his greatest asset. Hiei is a pure demon, headstrong like Kuwabara, but unlike him in every other way. Hiei is a born loner and is completely comfortable being alone, only allying himself with others when necessary, and often having ulterior motives when doing so. No problem with killing, no problem with suffering. Hiei relies more on absolute hard-hitting aggressive strength than anyone else on the show. He's conceited, he's jaded, he's a cocky dick. But you will find out how he got there. Some other standout characters include Botan, Yusuke's spirit guide who becomes such great friends with him that she often takes a human form in order to help him. Though not a fighter, Botan is often at the front of the action and takes a proactive role in most of the gang's adventures. And when she's not, she's their biggest cheerleader. Botan is like the sister Yusuke never had. Koinma, the substitute ruler of Spirit World, who, even though in the beginning, seems like an annoying toddler, becomes a really well-developed character, eventually even putting his neck on the line for his spirit detective and earning the audience's respect. And Genkai, Yusuke's mentor. Genkai is a character that would earn anyone's respect. She is initially the only adult who Yusuke respects, and their relationship over the course of this series is incredible. As Yusuke grows from a hardened youth who sees her as just another person controlling him, to a person who truly loves her like family. Genkai in turn stops seeing Yusuke as an impossible to reach nitwit, and starts seeing him as one truly worthy of her power. Those are my favorite protagonists, but then there's the others like Keiko, Shizuru, Ogre. Even these more minor characters still have personality and panache. Not to mention, the two major villains of this series, Tagoro and Sensui, are also both given a ton of development, making them super fleshed out characters as well. Without this level of character dedication, this show would not be what it is. A couple of other things to sell you on. The English voice acting in this show is incredible. Which is crazy because this was dubbed by Funimation who did Dragon Ball Z. Matter of fact, a lot of these voice actors came over from Dragon Ball Z. As I said in my DBZ review, DBZ had moments of really good voice acting, but overall was not good. Too much of this shit. 
Oh my. <laughs> but it just goes to show the difference that good voice directing makes, because the improvement in quality is like night and day. For example, here's a clip of Goku screaming. <laughs> now here's Yusuke screaming. Listen to that fucking difference. That's a scream. That's what a scream fucking sounds like. Justin Cook is Yusuke, Christopher Sabat is Kuwabara, Chuck Huber is Hiei, John Bergmeier is Karama, Cynthia Kranz is Botan, Sean Teague is Koenma, and Linda Young as Genkai. All excellent choices. Think about how many of those names were in Dragon Ball Z and how much better these vocal performances sound. That is the difference between good and bad sound direction. The animation is also very standout, especially in the fights. There's a lot of crazy looking attacks, the animation does this weird cool slow-mo limb elongation thing. As a matter of fact, a lot of the fights use an interesting slow-mo effect. It's cool, but also kind of silly, because a character will have an entire inner monologue of thought with themselves while throwing a punch, and people do not think that fast. Unrealistic? Yes. A welcome stylistic oddity? Also strangely yes. Then there's the themes of the show, which are actually pretty deep thoughts on the nature of life and people. Two of the biggest morals of this story is that one human life has an effect on countless others, and that being human is a struggle that every person must fight. Finally, the show raises a question of whether humanity is worth saving at all. This makes for a very deep fighting anime. Oh, and one last thing, this show has virtually no filler. Dead serious. I've heard this is rare for a long anime, and filler is fucking bullshit. So that's another reason I love this show so much. I can't promise that you'll enjoy every story arc in its entirety, but I can promise you that there's not a single episode of filler bullshit in the entire show. So now that I've basically explained to you how this show is more or less the show Dragon Ball Z could have been if it was written by somebody competent, I'd like to talk in a little bit more detail. So, spoilers. The Spirit Detective arc is great. This arc is the perfect intro to the world of Yu Yu, and I love that from the get-go it already feels as though these characters are in peril. Like, none of the enemies take it easy on Yusuke just because he's green. And even though this is the only arc that has multiple main enemies, there are few enough that they're all memorable, and one of them is even a big bad who winds up being the third greatest opponent Yusuke faces in the entire show. A lot of people tend to really overlook the first five episodes because they're not viewed as fighting focused like the rest of the show, but they're way better than most people give them credit for. Yusuke's fight to return to life after witnessing how much he meant to people is truly exciting and touching, and introduces one of the biggest concepts of the show. One life affects the countless lives around it. This is the beginning of Yusuke learning this lesson that comes into fruition towards the middle of the show. Also, there is fighting in these episodes. Think of all the fights Yusuke and Kuwabara get in, with or without each other. Oh, it's not a fight to the death? Well, neither were the fights in Three Kings. At least in these fights, the risks are low because it's the beginning. But these episodes, on top of showing Yusuke that life matters, also showcase his relationships with Keiko and Kuwabara. And his mother, who barely appears in the show after this. If she does it all, I can't even remember. But these first five episodes are exciting because Yusuke does have to do stuff in them. The whole house on fire thing, uh, the him coming back to life part, even the episode where he helps to save Kuwabara from expulsion. And when he isn't doing this stuff, the show plays out like it's a wonderful life. I really enjoy this part of the show. Also, this part has the two most underrated villains in the entire show. I'm talking about these two piece of shit teachers. Holy shit, these two are just genuinely fucking evil. I kept hoping they would get theirs, and they never do. I would like to point out, though, that if your friend is in a coma, you should take him to the hospital. Like, they still need to hook him up with nutrients so he doesn't starve to death. Also, the smoke inhalation would have dead-ass killed Yusuke here. But after that, we get some real entertaining mini-arcs. The Thieves, Rando, the Saint Beasts, the Tagoro Brothers, and each of these little arcs is a huge step in developing the rapport these characters have with each other. In the Thieves arc, Yusuke enters his first major battle with Goki, and actually loses. He doesn't beat him till he uses his brain and figures shit out. Then of course he meets Karama and Hiei, each interaction being a reflection of the future relationship he would have with each. 
There's his fight with Rando, during which his relationship with Genkai is formed, and during which Kuwabara discovers that he has spirit energy, which the show actually has been alluding to this whole time. And I love this fight because it's the first fight Yusuke is in where it really feels like he's fucked. Rando is the first villain in the show who truly puts the works on him. But that's only to prepare him for what comes next, the best mini-arc in the Spirit Detective arc, The Saint Beasts. This was the part of the show that solidified Yusuke, Kuwabara, Kurama, and Hiei as a unit. Yusuke as the natural leader and intuitive chance taker, Kuwabara as the moral compass, Kurama as the strategist, and Hiei as the wild card. This is the arc where these characters have to learn to trust each other and work with each other. Their dynamics with each other also develop here. And this part of the show puts them each to the test, each with their own battles against Genbu, Byako, Siryu, and Suzaku. And this is paired with a direct threat to Living World as the Makai insects take over Yusuke's town. My favorite fight in this part of the show may very well be Kuwabara's fight with Byako. When he javelins that fucking spirit sword and lands that punch that knocks Byako off, I cheered at the TV. This would be the first of probably 30 times that that happened. But Yusuke's fight with Suzaku is the real culmination of the Spirit Detective Saga. Yes, they do fight the Togoros after this, but that fight was fixed and the build-up was not on this level. Interspersed with clips of Yusuke's training with Genkai, Yusuke finally finds his reason to fight for the people he loves. And with all the odds stacked against him, after being electrocuted again and again and again, Yusuke soundly defeats and kills his strongest opponent yet, saving Keiko, Botan, and the Living World. It's a really magnificent build-up to a great battle, and in my opinion, is the crown-jeweled moment of the Spirit Detective arc. But it's not the end, because after that we have the final mini-arc, the Tagoro Brothers. Although not exactly the climax of the Spirit Detective saga, the Tagoro episodes set up a set of elements that are very relevant to the future. Hiei's sister Yukina is introduced. Their relationship is expanded upon later. Kuwabara falls in love with Yukina. Their relationship is expanded upon later. Kinda. The Tagoro brothers are introduced, and although they are pushovers in this fight, everything leading up to it solidifies their personalities and ethical codes, or lack thereof. And with Terukane and Sakyo, there lies the darkest human element in Yu Yu Hakusho. Wealthy human elites who use their connections to Demon World to wager on life, murder for their own gain, or torture for their own pleasure. These are truly the most vile set of characters in this show, with Sakio in particular being the single most evil, vile, and unredeemable character on the entire show. But the twist is that the Togoros were always in control. They were never in any real danger, and now Yusuke has piqued younger Togoro's interest. In the final moments of the Spirit Detective Saga, this impossible foe who sees something in Yusuke finally gives Yusuke the hardest test he's ever had. Win the Dark Tournament, or watch Tagoro murder everyone he loves. The Spirit Detective Saga is awesome, immersive, and immediately engaging, and kept me interested for the five smaller stories it has to tell, while telling a larger overarching one. Yusuke is going to need all the lessons he's learned so far, though, because now he's about to enter a very dark place. The Dark Tournament Saga is one of the most revered story arcs in anime. People often cite it as the greatest tournament arc in anime. And though I don't really have a comparison to make, it's fucking incredible. There is so much build-up, so much payoff, so much action, new powers reached, and with something real and personal on the line, as Team Yurameshi is forced to fight team after team in deathmatch after deathmatch. It's true, not everyone dies in these matches, but it's assumed that one is going to, and each combatant enters the ring ready to kill. Of course, this is the arc where the Tagoros truly become the big bads of the show, with younger Tagoro being the first of the show's only two major saga-long villains. And it's great seeing Team Tagoro lurking around this whole arc, popping up here and there to threaten Team Yurameshi, killing their opponents with effortless ease, while Team Yurameshi has to really work for their wins. It creates this impression of, these guys just barely scraped by on that last win, and they still have to face these fucking unbeatable powerhouses. Not to mention, because human crime lords are in charge of this tournament, it gets fixed quite a bit, so the rules are also stacked against Team Yurameshi. There are so many great moments in this arc, the debut and evolution of the Dragon of the Darkness Flame, 
the accidental unlocking of the horrifying Yoko Kurama, the battle against Team Ichigaki, which becomes a battle to save them from mind control that could have only been sensed by the man with the kindest heart, Kuwabara. And Kuwabara desperately trying to keep up with his three stronger teammates, his match loss is only accentuating his great wins. Yusuke being asleep for the whole beginning of the arc, Hiei using the spirit sword while still managing to insult Kuwabara, being led to believe that the masked fighter is Genkai only to be thrown off by a red herring, but no, it really is Genkai. That one episode preview where Yusuke goes, come on, these guys aren't gonna beat Team Tagoro, that actually had me cracking up. Those brief moments where they actually befriend some of the opponents they're supposed to be killing. And that's life. In this story arc, there's surprises, fun, and violence, and you can't ask for much more than that in an anime. And Yusuke's team is significantly stronger by the end of this arc than at the beginning. This is actually the story arc with the most, let's say, on-camera power scaling, and it's done at a pace that lasts the whole arc. This is also the arc where Yusuke spends the most downtime with Keiko, making it sort of the arc where their relationship develops the most. But it's Yusuke's relationship with Genkai that becomes the emotional crux of this story arc, and it is told beautifully. When she tests Yusuke and he refuses to kill her, he says the thing that encapsulates what she means to him. You're the only person who ever taught me anything useful. So then begins the painful trial of Genkai giving all of her spirit energy to Yusuke. And when he finally overcomes it, Genkai is finished teaching him. The student has surpassed the master and graduated. But then comes one of the greatest reveals in the series, the secret history between Genkai and Tagoro. Their relationship, what Tagoro did to become a demon, the whole reason Genkai entered the tournament, it all happens in one fell swoop, but it also makes everything make sense. Tagoro's obsession with Yusuke, his desire to fight him, and his forcing him into this tournament. Tagoro, terrified of his own weakness, eventual death, and the insecurities that come along with being human, chose to become a demon. He turned his back on being human, and Yusuke learned something from this. But then it happens, the death of Genkai. After everything they've been through together, from hating how hard she was on him to loving her like the Guardian he never had, the greatest relationship in the entire show comes to a tragic close. Or so he thought. And her death feels impactful. There is a moment that really struck me after she dies where we see Botan just bawling in the bathroom. That made it feel so real. And naturally, this is all meant to make Yusuke and us despise Tagoro all the more. After this, we can't wait to see Yusuke rip this motherfucker's head off. So then we get to the climactic finale, Team Urameshi vs Team Tagoro. And these last fights, my god, did they save the best for last. Each one of these fights is nothing short of incredible. They really brought out the stops for this one. Any of these fights could be on the level of a series finale fight. That's how fucking good they are. Each battle has twists and turns. You think it's going in one direction, then it switches it up. There's plenty of great dialogue exchanges. Each of the opponents are perfectly matched up, and each member of Team Tagoro makes each member of Team Urameshi work. They actually bring out the best in their fighting capabilities. Karasu actually has some build-up before his fight with Kurama, enough build-up to make Kurama nervous about facing him. Karasu has this weird obsession with, I think, murdering people he has a crush on because it's the ultimate form of intimacy. I think that's what I got out of this. And so he enjoys torture. My favorite moment in this fight, and one of my favorite shots in the series, is the scene where Karasu dives into Yoko, and it cuts to the stadium exploding. I really love this shot. Bui and Hiei's fight transforms Bui from the most mysterious member of Team Tagoro into the most sympathetic member. He's by far the least evil member of the team, doesn't enjoy torture, doesn't threaten his opponent's loved ones, he's only there because he has to be. His goal is to defeat Tagoro and become free. For all we know, he was a hero like Yusuke fighting Tagoro for similar reasons. But this motherfucker is still strong and dangerous. The tile toss, removing the armor, launching Hiei's own dragon back at him in apparent victory, but then it happens, Hiei comes back from the dragon dimension, and it's revealed what all that solitary training throughout the saga did for him. That part where he says, I am the dragon, sent chills down my spine. And that beautifully animated part where Bui launches one final, desperate, brutal physical attack against Hiei that has absolutely no effect on him is so cool. 
It's a shame Bui disappeared after this. He's still alive, they could have done something with him. Elder Tagoro and Kuabara is awesome because of how outmatched Kuabara seems to be. They put the man with the honor code up against Team Tagoro's most horrible sadist. And Elder Tagoro has the most grotesque power. He's indestructible, loves, loves, loves torture, but also chooses the perfect moment to drop the news of Genkai's death to Kuabara dealing a low blow psychologically as well. This has the opposite effect that he intended, giving Kuwabara an extra boost of strength. And then, after all else fails to destroy him, Kuwabara, in a rare moment for him, outwits his opponent with the spirit fly swatter. This was not the last we'd see of Elder Tagoro, but it seemed like it at the time. I'd like to quickly point out that Koenma really shows up during the finals. Before this moment, he was just the toddler boss who sent Yusuke on life-threatening missions, and occasionally gives him an egg that might hatch a monster that eats his fucking soul or something. But he sticks his neck out for Yusuke for the first time here. And then finally, the fight between Yusuke and younger Tagoro. This fight shows how strong Yusuke has become, but it's still not enough until Genkai goads Tagoro into killing Kuwabara, which of course is what finally breaks the mental wall between Yusuke and his feelings, bringing out his full energy. This fight is incredible. Even though it's the most static fight of the finals, every dialogue pause is actually meaningful, and those moments where there is fighting are impactful. As we see Yusuke evolve from not being able to make a scratch in Tagoro to exceeding him in power, and finally discovering Tagoro's motives for picking Yusuke was timed perfectly. After selling his soul for power, Tagoro had no enemies or motive to fight left, and so his only driving force became finding the one person who could destroy him at his peak. He wanted closure. He forced Yusuke to give him that closure. But he also saw himself in Yusuke and wanted him to become like him. If he can corrupt Yusuke, that's his way of truly defeating Genkai, even if he loses. And after everything he's seen and been through, losing people he loved due to his own weakness just like Tagoro had, Yusuke will not do it. This fight was the moment Yusuke became a man on this show. And that moment where Yusuke tells Tagoro what really happened, that he didn't let go of his humanity but ran from it because he was afraid of ever being weak again, right before unleashing his final attack and smoke in his ass. Man, this fight has layers. This show has layers. This fight closes the first half of the show, which is the coming-of-age portion of Yusuke's story. Then finally in the afterlife, it's revealed exactly why Tagoro made the decision he did, and in a single episode, a whole new layer of sympathy is added to this character we've grown to despise for the last, like, 40 episodes of the show. His goodbye to Genkai is truly heartbreaking. Of course, Sakyo's story ends too, and man, this guy is pure evil. Tagoro and Sensui at least have motives beyond seeing everyone other than themselves as playthings, and welcoming the destruction of the world because they're bored. He even welcomes his own death out of the sheer boredom of having nothing left to challenge his power. Here, Shizuru, I'm a fucking serial killer, have my lighter as a keepsake. But then the Dark Tournament saga ends with one moment that kinda sticks in my craw. I don't think Genkai should have been brought back to life. I mean, the biggest reason, of course, is her death left an impact on the characters that shouldn't have been robbed of meaning. That was an enormous moment in the show, and bringing her back sort of feels like a betrayal. But also, the method behind bringing her back didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yes, that's the team's wish for winning the tournament, but the committee grants the wishes, right? Didn't Sakyo kill them all? It's never mentioned what grants Koenma the authority to bend the rules and bring her back. Like, did he make a deal with the Dark Tournament Committee? It's pretty clear that he hates this tournament, I can't imagine he would bend the rules for these psychos. It's never even really stated where the wish-granting power comes from. The Dark Tournament Committee are all human beings. Yeah, bringing her back never made a lot of sense to me. Now, don't get me wrong, she's instrumental in the next story arc, and she's one of my favorite characters, no doubt, but I would have much preferred her to be a voice guiding Yusuke in his head than this deus ex machina we got. But save for this, the Dark Tournament saga is pretty much a masterpiece. It's a tournament arc that doubles as the main character's biggest developmental moment. We get to see these guys rise in power, little by little, until they win the tournament and their loved one's freedom. They are all different for having participated in it. And though this isn't my favorite story arc in the show, it's a lot of other people's. And that's perfectly fine. There is an argument to be made over which is better, but for me, the best is yet to come. Folks, thank you so much for watching part one of my Yu Yu Hakusho review. Part two will be coming out before you know it. 
Please like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon link in the descriptions. Folks, welcome back to my review of Yu Yu Hakusho. This is part two. If you haven't watched part one, do that first, because this is clearly part two. The Chapter Black Saga is without a doubt my favorite story arc of Yu Yu Hakusho. If the Dark Tournament was about each character's personal growth, Chapter Black is about them taking that growth and applying it as a team against the most horrifying threat in the entire show. Shinobu Sensui is my favorite villain on Yu Yu. The former spirit detective who just had a really, really, really bad day at work one day. Sensui's story is the tragedy of a man so stuck in his ways that when he's confronted by something that proves his core values wrong, the only way his mind can cope is by doing a 180. This 180, unfortunately, was a plot to open the portal to Demon World and destroy every human on Earth. Combine this with the fact that the man collects henchmen by finding broken anti-social psychics who hate their own species, and poisoning their minds by showing them the Chapter Black tape. Or in one case, grooming a child to his cause who doesn't even really understand the true nature of what he's trying to accomplish. And sacrificing these people the moment they're no longer useful to him. Yeah, backstory or not, Sensui is unrepentantly psychotic. But his story opens up a question that really is the backbone of Chapter Black. Are human beings worth saving? This is the question presented from the villains to the heroes and vice versa. This isn't just a battle of strength or a battle of wits. This is a battle of morality. And both sides have some good points, even the bad guys. This is a very deep arc. Yu Yu had plenty of thematic depth before this arc, but this one seems to put its theme right in the forefront. Chapter Black also has this enormous sense of urgency. There's a countdown here and the heroes are fighting against time. You feel this urgency in every moment of this arc. This arc also creates challenges for our heroes in which they can't solely rely on strength. The villains in this arc are humans, and aside from Sensui, they're physically weaker than the heroes. So the concept of territory is introduced, which ends up being an extremely well-conceptualized tool to put the main character's powers in check. The use of territory in this arc creates some awesome battles of wit that we only see in this arc, and keeps the main characters from becoming too overpowered against villains that they'd otherwise cream instantly. The introduction to these concepts occurs in the beginning of this arc when the gang faces off against Kido, Kato, and Yana in what winds up being a test employed by Genkai to prepare them for the mission they're about to face. I actually grew pretty fond of these guys and was sad to see them disappear after this arc ended. Though I did think it was hilarious when at the end of the arc, Kubara is like, hey, we should hang out sometime, and they're just like, nah, we're good. The saga progresses as the heroes face off against Sensui's goons, five human psychics with incredible territory powers. And each matchup with these goons is really memorable. Yusuke's fight with a doctor is the first time he runs the risk of killing a human being. And Kuwabara's fight with Seaman, whose real name was obviously mispronounced because the English dub didn't want people calling him Seaman, he unlocks his most powerful attack on the show the Dimension Sword. And I love that he was the one since we was looking for all this time. And the reveal was fucking awesome. Fuck with his friends, he shatters dimensions. Of course, knowing what he finds out about Seaman, Kuwabara, having a heart as big as the whole world, not only spares him, but carries him to safety. This human kindness shatters Seaman's preconceived notions about his own kind. Sniper, great fight, love the flying knives, and the return of Hiei. Of course he was gonna help them. Game Master's territory turned into a surprisingly tragic part of the show, as it turned out that he wasn't in on Sensui's plan at all. Sensui used him to stall them, not even telling him that if he loses, he would die. Kurama has to make the toughest decision of his life, killing a child in order to save humanity. This was deep. This really illustrated the difference between who Kurama was before and after becoming Suichi. Kurama is haunted by this. I'd also like to point out that the game rules being understandable in an English dub is a real testament to how well translated this show is. Then there's Gourmet, who is actually Elder Tagoro. Already in a dark place, Kurama shows this fucker absolutely no mercy, trapping him in the sinning tree forever. This was a fate worse than death. Then there's the fight with Sensui. Oh man, this fight is nuts. Without a doubt my favorite fight in the series. Also the longest. A lot happens. Yusuke versus Sensui while the others are trapped in the Yurea, Yurea Toko, I think I'm pronouncing that right, which is basically Itsuki's territory. Here we actually find out why Itsuki follows Sensui. Unlike the others, he wasn't brainwashed. He's just madly in love with the guy. All seven of him. That's right, this is also the part where it's revealed that Sensui has seven personalities, though I'm pretty sure we only meet three of them. Not all of them were made for combat. 
I thought this was just a tad dumb at first, but this exists for three reasons. One, so that Sensui doesn't have to face the evil he's committed in order to do what he thinks is the right thing. Two, so that when Shinobu is truly revealed, it's a power level increase that hits us like what? And three, as an explanation for why Sensui and no one else in the whole show has mastered sacred energy the energy reservoir that's stronger than all others. And then Kawinma once again really shows up for our guy, and this time it's personal. Kawinma feels guilty for what Sensui has become, and you can see the toll that it takes on him this entire arc. This was a layer of depth to Kawinma that I really loved, and when he's ready to sacrifice himself as penance for the mistake he made, and Yusuke says, you're not ready to die, you just stop teething, my man! But not as much as what happens right after. Yusuke has a plan. He's going to do for Kuwabara what Tagoro did for him. He's going to die so that the others can dive into their energy reservoirs and destroy Sensui. The moment before he dies, when Kuwabara desperately tries to unlock the dimensional sword but can't at first because his emotions need to reach that climax, and he's having that tear-jerking flashback about how much he respected and loved Yusuke before they even really became friends, and how much he means to him, and then he finally gets the sword to work and cuts through, and it's too late. Yusuke Urameshi is dead. This is the most powerful moment in the entire show. My god, the editing, the music, the, the everything. And now we see how much Yusuke really meant to these guys as they launch an all-out attack on Sensui, fully powered up all the way into Demon World, even cutting the strings to keep the high-class demons out just to take him down. And the moment we first see Demon World, wow, incredible. And these guys are ready to go down fighting. At this point, they each know they can't beat him, but fuck it. And then, wait a second. Who are these guys? They work for Spirit World? What are they, human? What's a Mazaku? What's going on here? And holy shit, did Pooh just evolve like a fucking Pokemon? Fuck it, ask the questions later because Yusuke's back, baby! But first, he trolls the Defense Force in classic Yusuke style. He goes in there for fight number three and the part where Hiei says, I got your back, made me shout fuck yeah at my TV, and then the final fight. And then Yusuke really becomes the Mazaku and since we seems satisfied. Satisfied to die this way. And then, finally dies spectacularly. And though I do love the way Sensui went out, knowing that if he had to be defeated it was by a demon, the way Yusuke defeats him, not quite in control of his own body, is something I don't know how I feel about. It works as a segue into the final arc of the show for sure, but, well, you probably know what I have to say about that, so let's save it. And although people say the demon Yusuke angle was anticlimactic or deus ex machina, I hear ya, but it worked for me. It worked because of the closure it provided for Sensui's story. Sensui was killed by that which he had killed all his life. His life came full circle. And Sensui himself says, it was you who killed me, and that consciousness exists on many levels. So, fuck it. It kinda works for me. I'm judging Chapter Black on its own merits, not on how much of it bled into Three Kings. This is a decent ending for an arc. And then we get a final episode where we actually see what happened to all of the characters who only appear in this arc including Itsuki, who just cuddles with Sensui's dead body for all eternity? That was a little weird. Also, that thing happens again where characters who were supposed to remain dead come back to life, and this time it's explained even less. But this aside, Chapter Black is, to me, the crown jewel of Yu Yu Hakusho story arcs. With the highest stakes, the most insurmountable odds, twists and turns, shocking revelations, one of the greatest, most evil, and most compelling villains in TV, and the deepest question this show dares to ask, the final challenge that the four main characters would face together, is without a doubt, my favorite one the show has to offer. When I think about Yu Yu Hakusho, the first thing I think about is Chapter Black. So how on earth could you ever make a follow-up that could top this? Well, they didn't. I need to start off by saying that Three Kings is not bad. There are certainly parts of this saga that I love. The problem that most people have with this story arc, and I agree with this, is that it is noticeably inferior to the three arcs that come before it. This has a lot to do with the fact that Yoshihiro Tagashi was losing his fucking mind at this point. Writing the manga was consuming his life, and he wanted out. Three Kings is a testament to this, because despite this story arc being disappointing, it still gives the show a surprisingly good ending, and didn't leave a completely sour taste in my mouth. You see, when Tagashi got tired from writing manga, he retired. He didn't just keep going, even though he'd forgotten half of what he'd already written. So what good things can I say about Three Kings? 
Well, Hiei and Kurama's backstories are told beautifully, especially Hiei's. We hadn't seen Yukina for a while, so it was nice to bring that back into the forefront and actually explore this broken person's history. I love the reveal that Yukina left Demon World of her own accord because she never forgave her people for what they did to Hiei. I likewise enjoyed the fact that Kurama had unfinished business before he became Suichi, and that changing from Demon World's coldest bastard into a normal human, capable of love and morality, doesn't change Yomi's disdain for him at first. And most importantly, it's the final leg of Yusuke's journey, and there are some highlights. He meets the first spirit detective, which was cool, but also fucking weird, because why is the first spirit detective still alive? How is this a recent job profession? Shouldn't this have existed since at least the beginning of Civilization? I also ended up really liking Raisin and his backstory. Of the Three Kings, Raisin was easily my favorite. I enjoyed the parallels between the woman Raisin loved and Yusuke returning to Keiko. Yusuke actually learns something from his demon father other than greater power. I love the idea that a demon starving himself to death would take centuries because they live longer. But how are these demons finding the humans they were eating? If the barrier has existed for a while, shouldn't they all be starving to death? Oh geez, the cracks are beginning to show, huh? I think the decision Yusuke makes to decide the fate of Demon World in a tournament was a huge detriment to this arc. I'd make the argument that the first half of Three Kings before the tournament is far better than the tournament part, and if they had gone for Yusuke needing to fight his friends and maybe they remember, hey, you're our friend, and take his side and team up on Yomi and Makuro, that would have been a lot better than what we got. Additionally, Yomi and Makuro are not good antagonists. Makuro is a great character, and I actually like the way she was set up as Hiei's love interest, but she stops being a villain after that. And Yomi only threatens Kurama's family in the beginning, not really doing much else after. This tournament feels like there are no stakes. For starters, no one gets killed or is even really trying to kill, and considering the last tournament this series gave us was a gory, visceral death tournament, with huge amounts of character and story development in each fight, this one pales in comparison. Because of this, most of the fights are glossed over, including the final fight of the entire series. I'm fine with Yusuke losing this fight. I didn't want him to become Demon King anyway, but this series has never done this in a fight. What the fuck? Not to mention the fight between Yomi and his son was the only fight in the entire series that I just did not give a fuck about. We just met this kid. We have no stake in this fight. Now, if this was a fight to the death and he killed his own son to drive the story forward and make us go, holy shit, that would have been cool, but that's not what happened. It's kind of funny the part where Yusuke says, I don't know what I'm fighting for anymore, because that's the way I was feeling at this point. The show didn't know what its point was in this saga. But all of this pales in comparison to the gravest sin that this arc commits. They cut Kuwabara out of the action. I hated this. I don't know why they did this. It's a bunch of demons and he's only human? So what? That was only him the entire fucking show. Kuwabara loves fighting and now he's studying? I thought he'd make a surprise last minute appearance, but he never did. They put Kuwabara in the corner. And no one but no one puts Kuwabara in the corner. These four guys are the backbone of the show. These four guys, not three. And Kuwabara being a huge contender for my favorite character, this did not sit right with me. Disappointing. Yes. Anticlimactic. Yes. Three Kings is without a doubt, and very sadly, the worst story arc by far in Yu Yu. But a lot of that stems from how much closer to being flawless most of the show was that came before it. And though it's the worst story arc, it's still not outright bad. It's the shortest arc, and the disappointments only come when the tournament starts. Everything leading up to that is really well executed. So given that that part doesn't last long, this arc certainly doesn't ruin what came before or directly after. And what comes after is the end of the show, and Yu Yu Hakusho has a really great final episode. Honestly, kind of a perfect final episode. Everyone's in a different school now, there's peace in demon and human world, with the one no longer invading the other. The gang reunites except for Hiei, which makes sense. His ending, working for demon world, totally works. Genkai announces that she's willing her property over to the gang upon her death. Then of course, Yusuke returns. Having found all the answers he was looking for, he's finally ready to commit to something all the way. He finally embodies everything he was taught. And even though he did become a demon, this moment reinforces Genkai's words to him. He never turned his back on his humanity. He didn't run from life. He ran towards it. No matter how disappointing Three Kings might have been, this was a great final episode. Though I guess I would have liked to see Hiei finally tell Yukina that he's her brother. I do like that final scene between him and Kurama, but the fact that this was brought up a second time in Three Kings really made me think he was going to tell her. Hell, it would have been nice for Yukina to also finally, 
I don't know, directly acknowledge that Kuwabara is madly in love with her. He's been very open about it, but she never seems to directly address it. Oh, that Kazuma sure is silly. Girl, my boy is pouring his fucking heart out to you. Oh, and I love that the show was a documentary this whole time. In a lot of anime from this era, the previews of the next episodes at the end are narrated by one of the characters. Wait, how do these characters know that they're on a show? Like, what? But this time, they actually made this dumbass trope make sense within the show. Maybe I'm making a huge deal out of this, but I fucking love this. This makes everything make sense. They filmed everything and turned it into Yu Yu Hakusho. Then got the guys to do these previews like a DVD commentary. And Ogre was the narrator. Hell yeah. Alright, so now that the season by season is finished, here's some random thoughts that didn't fit exactly into any specific season of the show. I'd like to point out that Yu Yu Hakusho is a really quotable show. There are so many good lines, and not just the heavy stuff either. There's one-liners and silly stuff in there that I love too. And I mean like, way too many to name them all. But here's some quick favorites. The show's one glaring negative is that it backpedals on characters dying without explanation. The biggest sin here is of course Genkai's resurrection, a moment that I think really detracted from the impact of her death. But they also do this with Sensui's accomplices, which makes even less sense. Like, did they all die unexpectedly like Yusuke did and had to put their souls back in their bodies? Speaking of which, Yusuke's whole ass adventure begins when he selflessly saves that kid, right? Then Botan tells Yusuke that there isn't a place for him in Spirit World yet because no one expected him to sacrifice himself for someone else. And there's no way this is the first time this has happened, or even happened recently. There's enough people on the planet that someone doing an unexpected thing that puts them in mortal danger is happening at any given moment. So this ghost thing is happening with some regularity, which means the afterlife only seems sees what's happening on the outside, and not what's actually going on inside a person? That's terrifying! Like, the people in charge of the afterlife already filed this kid under bad egg and probably going to hell, and are so confused by an act of selflessness that this happens. He's 14! He's not even an adult yet! Cut him some slack! It also would have been interesting to see the kid he saves make a reappearance later on. This kid is a pivotal character in the show, but he only shows up in the first couple episodes. When something like this happens in the beginning of a show, I'm always hoping it'll come back full circle. Like, maybe this kid could have been the next spirit detective or something. It's a low-risk job now that Demon World is chill. I kinda wish we'd been given a little more information on the world of this show. Spirit World, Demon World, Human World. There is a distinct separation between humans and demons physically, culturally, and biologically, that I would have liked to learn more of. There are good demons on the show, there are bad ones, there is an actual tier list that divides demons into a caste system of intelligence and strength. Why? Why does demon culture value life less than human culture? And it's made very clear that they do. Demons kill each other left and right, and it's accepted within each demon civilization. Why were they made differently at all? Why does spirit world favor humans over demons? Sure, our lifespans are way shorter, but they gave the humans planet Earth and gave the demons this nightmare hellscape. To the point where demons are always trying to escape it. And it's against the code of spirit world for a demon or a human to take the life of a human, but not a demon. They don't give a shit when demons kill each other. Humans are clearly shown some form of preferential treatment. Why is it frowned upon for humans to become aware of spirit world, but not demons? Most humans don't know demons exist, but nearly all demons seem to know about humans. Why do some demons resemble humans biologically? Some can even have sex with them and reproduce with them. Some eat them. What about spirit world? What are these guys? Are they angels? How does that world work? There's gotta be angels if they're sacred energy, right? I really would have liked to get an explanation for some of this stuff. I like the way power levels work in this show. No one is overpowered. Signature moves drain energy from the fighters that they have to recoup. A truly powerful, formidable attack might hit a wall when stacked up to an opponent who has that one defensive maneuver that can counter it. Just when you think the gang has reached the heights of power, BAM, they hit you with the territory concept, a roadblock to fighting power. Not to mention the attacks themselves in the show are truly interesting to watch. A character's signature move doesn't resemble any other character's signature move. They're given their own design and identity. I also like how the attacks are announced in English and Japanese subtitles. It gives a weird vintage kung fu vibe to the show. So boy am I glad I rewatched this show and finally finished it. Because Yu Yu Hakusho easily stood the test of time. I was just as engaged by it as an adult as I was when I first watched it as a kid. And for a guy who doesn't really watch anime that much, watching one this long that was this good was really refreshing. The characters, the writing, the motivations, the fights, the music, the animation, all evoke that feeling in you. That feeling like you're on the edge of your seat, can't wait to see what happens next. 
Can't wait for the bad guy to fall or for the hero to make a breakthrough. And isn't that the feeling that a fighting anime is supposed to give us? As kids or as adults? If that's the case, if that's what makes this type of cartoon good, then Yu Yu Hakusho is certainly good anime. But for this plebe who doesn't have a peer to compare it to, it is definitely, he's gonna say it, without a doubt, he's gonna say it, good TV. Ah, uh, hell yeah! Hey, can I have that wine bottle if you're not gonna use it? Guys, thank you so much for watching. How do you feel about Yu Yu Hakusho? How do you feel about how I feel about Yu Yu Hakusho? If you enjoyed this review, like, subscribe, and consider donating $1 to my Patreon. I also have an unrelated, super fucked up comedy podcast you can listen to called The Haha ha Men. Links in the descriptions.